Hey, everybody, welcome to the Addiction Unlimited podcast, where you get to learn everything you want to know about addiction and recovery. I'm your host, Angela Pugh, co founder of Kansas City Recovery, life coach, and recovering alcoholic. To learn more about me, you can listen to episode zero on your podcast app or find us on the web at addictionunlimited.com. Hello, my friend. Welcome to episode number 204 of the Addiction Unlimited podcast. I'm your coach, Angela Pugh, life coach, recovering alcoholic, and entrepreneur. If you're new here, this is a coaching podcast. I help you build coping skills, life skills, build your recovery, whether you're recovering from substance or just recovering from life. But that's what we're doing here, learning to be better, feel better, and create a life you love. And this is number two in my three-part series, Boundaries, Codependence, and Self-Esteem. And boy, do I have some good stuff for you today. You guys really enjoyed the episode a couple of weeks ago with Michelle Ferris on codependence. I got a ton of amazing comments in the Facebook group, and I love that. I love when we have like continued conversation about an episode in the Facebook group. So much fun. Love that. And many of you were talking about being surprised at what codependence really means. And I remember feeling exactly the same way many years ago when I started to explore this piece of myself. Like when I really started to understand what codependence was, I felt almost shocked at how fitting it was (laughs) and like how many of these personality traits I had, how codependent I was, because that wasn't something I would have labeled myself. I'm a very independent human. You know, I'm self-sufficient, self-supporting and have been for a hundred years. So codependent was never something, was never an adjective I would use about myself. And I know I was seeing a lot of that with you guys in the Facebook group, like just that surprise at, wow, I never would have thought of it like that. Oh my gosh, so many light bulb moments. And yes, I remember feeling exactly the same way. And you may have noticed too, in my episodes, I always ask people to explain things more or better. And that's because we see these sort of buzzwords out in the world and hear people talk about the buzzwords, whatever they are at the moment. And we rarely take the time to dig a little deeper and understand what the buzzwords really mean. I like doing the deep dive (laughs) with all these concepts, like figuring out how to apply it to your daily life, how it makes sense for you and getting real strategies about how to make change. These struggles of codependence, boundaries, and self-esteem are universal, you guys. These aren't issues specific to addiction. These are issues that are specific to life and the human condition. So if you're a human being, you're going to struggle with some of this stuff. At the same time, you can't effectively recover for the long term without addressing some of this stuff and making improvements. Otherwise, you will still continue to be uncomfortable and not proud of who you are as a person. And when you have that underlying discomfort and low self-esteem, it makes it very challenging to recover, very challenging to stay sober. And that's also when we'll transfer to another unhealthy behavior. Like as an alcoholic, if I continue to be uncomfortable and not like myself, there's a huge chance I will go back to drinking. Now, if I stay sober and still feel uncomfortable and don't like, trust, or believe in myself, then I will transfer to another unhealthy habit or even another addiction, sex, food, shopping, whatever it may be. If I stay sober and still don't like how I feel, still feel bad about myself, then I'll just transfer to another unhealthy behavior. 
And that's what we see so much too. And all of us can relate to this, right? It's like you quit drinking and we start eating like crazy people, you know, (laughs) whatever the thing may be. And that's what that's really all about is just you still have some underlying discomfort. And in early sobriety, of course, you're going to have some underlying discomfort. You're just starting to get into all that stuff. So I just want you to have that awareness that these struggles that we have, right, boundaries, codependence, self-esteem, and there's a million others that we've got podcasts on, but these are the things that we have to work on to feel good about ourselves, which then allows us to stay in recovery and feeling good about ourselves. See how it all ties together there? To recover from life and all the curveballs it will throw at you, it's imperative that we see these troublesome pieces of ourselves and spend some time healing them. So I'm going to start this episode by laying out some codependent behaviors. And there are codependent personality patterns. We will all identify with all of them in different ways. And we'll talk about that as I get into them. And I'm going to take it a step further. There are different reasons we use different codependent behaviors. And we're going to dig into denial patterns, compliance patterns, and control patterns. These are the ones that I think you will most identify with and be able to see in yourself. And When I was researching this episode, this is one of my favorite things about my job as a coach. My first favorite thing is the clients I get to work with because you guys are amazing and funny and smart and I love every minute I get to spend with you. I'm seriously blessed there. The other thing is I am held accountable to doing my own work on myself all day the time (laughs) because I'm always reading and researching and writing blogs and doing podcasts and videos and like it just holds me to this other level of accountability like I don't get to forget about working on my codependence problems you know (laughs) because I'm immersed in it and I love that and I love that we get to do it all together. So I'm researching this episode and reading all these articles and blog posts, and I get to see firsthand where I have work to do. As I'm bringing this information to you, I'm also doing my own learning and getting to see where I've slipped back a bit, or I learn a whole new behavior that I didn't even know about before. (laughs) And this is why, too, This is why recovery and self-help and personal development are so empowering. You get to do this work on yourself and understand yourself on a deeper level. And that gives you the power and knowledge to self-soothe in difficult situations. And you know how to navigate yourself in your life to create a life you love and be a person you love. You know yourself on such a deep level, it allows you to build deeper, more meaningful relationships because you know yourself and you know how to teach others about you. I mean, this is powerful stuff, my friends, powerful stuff. So let's get into these categories and get a better understanding of it all. Then I also got a question from a listener who asked me to talk about the difference between being responsible for someone and being responsible to someone. So we're going to talk about that as well. Let's start with denial patterns. In denial patterns, codependents often have difficulty identifying what they're feeling We can all relate to that, right? Especially in early recovery. This was a huge struggle for me. And it's something we talk about all the time with my clients in individual sessions, in the sober society community, in the Facebook community. Like feelings are huge. And feelings are really hard to identify, especially in early recovery, because we've just spent all of these years drowning them. Like we drink or use for every feeling on the planet to kill it. So of course, in early recovery, of course we can't identify what we're really feeling because we've spent all this time killing our feelings. So have difficulty identify what they're feeling. Minimize, alter, or deny how they truly feel. 
And I want you to think about this because minimizing is a little sticky point with me. It's something I really focus on and recognize in a lot of people. I'll probably do a podcast episode this year about it. But we have this tendency to minimize ourselves. And I want you to think about this in the regard that when you minimize yourself, what you're doing is teaching other people to minimize you also. Then what happens is we get mad at people for minimizing us, minimizing our experience or how we feel. But the truth is we taught them to do that. So minimizing or denying how you truly feel is little stuff like, how are you? Oh, I'm good. When really you're not. Or when something happens, something major happens in your life, you experience a death or you lose your job or your child gets hurt, something that really is big. It's a big deal. And somebody says, oh my gosh, I heard what happened. I'm so sorry. How are you? And you're like, oh, I'm fine. I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. That's minimizing yourself in your experience and how you truly feel. And not meaning that you need to be overly dramatic and give everybody a 30-minute rundown on every thought you've had, but you know, somebody says to you, oh my gosh, I heard what happened. So sorry. Are you okay? You can say, you know what? It's been really challenging, actually. Thank you for asking. I'm just getting through it one day at a time. I really appreciate you asking. It's just that simple, right? But you have to own it. Don't minimize yourself when you go, oh, I'm fine. I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. Then nobody's going to worry about you. And then you're going to be mad about it. So don't minimize yourself. Next one, Uh, codependents often perceive themselves as completely unselfish and dedicated to the well-being of others. Ooh, this is a tricky one. So we know we have people-pleasing, right? And people-pleasing is a part of codependence. And oftentimes people get in this people-pleasing mode and they go so far out of their way to people-please that they don't realize there's a negative side to that too. And a lot of people-pleasing is purely selfish. A lot of people-pleasing is to get a feeling for yourself. It's not really about doing for others. And we get really confused with that. And somebody will say, well, that's selfish or self-serving. You're like, oh my gosh, not me. I do everything for others. But the truth is you do everything for others so that you can feel good about yourself. It's not about doing everything for others. <laughs> so that's a tricky one too. Next one, codependents often label others with their negative traits. You've heard the phrase projection and people say, oh, you're projecting your stuff onto me. We absolutely do that as human beings. That's a very real thing. Or you may have heard, um, there's all kinds of little catchphrases and cliches about this. If you spot it, you've got it, (laughs) right? Because typically the things you notice in other people, especially things that drive you crazy, are traits that you have yourself. And we do project our things onto other people. So this is a reason too, I always say, when something is driving me crazy, if somebody is behaving in a certain way and it's nagging at me, the first thing I will do is look at myself and go, wait, do I do that? Because if you spot it, you've got it. (laughs) So get introspective with that and say, okay, get honest. Like, do I do that too? Because I'm telling you nine times out of 10, you'll find that you do that too. Codependents often mask pain in various ways, such as anger, humor, or isolation. This is big too. And part of the same thing we talked about earlier about minimizing how you truly feel, right? We mask it. And this goes with the next one on the list, which is express negativity or aggression in indirect and passive ways. So we use humor to diffuse a situation. And listen, humor is a go-to for me, but I use humor as an icebreaker. I don't use humor to distract people from me or my feelings or situation. I use it as an icebreaker. But often what we'll do 
certainly using anger because anger is a very socially acceptable response for men and women. It's acceptable to get angry or to be irritated where if you cry, that can be frowned upon. You know, thank goodness a lot of that is changing. But like when girls cry, people tend to freak out. And I'm always like, listen, we're just crying, dude. It's not that big of a deal. Like it doesn't mean you did anything. It doesn't mean you have to do something to fix it. It's just an expression. <laughs> like don't freak out. Just let a girl cry, right? It's just what happens. A lot of times for men, when they get their feelings hurt or something, it comes out as anger and they can get snappy and irritable and short-tempered and it's the same thing. Girls cry, boys get mad. But don't use the anger or humor or isolation to cover what you feel or distract people from what you're really going through or even to distract yourself because we'll do that too. If I don't want to deal with something, you know, I can go isolate with a book or binge watch Netflix or cuddle my dog and I don't have to think about it, right? It's the escapism, just like drinking or drugs or sex or exercise or food, right? It's masking and we don't want to use those things to mask. We want to be able to own it and get comfortable with it so we can move forward through it. And the other one I said, express negativity or aggression in indirect and passive ways. This is what we do. We all know passive aggressive behavior. And I have a podcast coming out later this year about passive aggressive behavior too, (laughs) because that's a tough one for me. I'm such a own it person, you know, that passive aggressive can be challenging for me. And we all do this stuff, right? It's like you don't have the courage to really set boundaries and be direct about it. So you get indirect. And and that's when you have the little side comments under your breath that you do with your partner or rolling your eyes. Like you don't have the courage to stand up and say, well, I don't really agree with that. So you'll roll your eyes so to let them know that you think they're an idiot or whatever. So these are all denial patterns, denying how you really feel and denying yourself the opportunity to stand up and own how you really feel. The last one on this denial list is codependents often do not recognize the unavailability of those people to whom they are attracted. I mean, holy crap, you guys, that is my dating life for a couple of decades. You know, like I was never able to recognize that I would always gravitate toward emotionally unavailable people. And I could never recognize the signs of the unavailability. You know, it's insanity when I think about it now, but I definitely had that. And we do this with family members. We do this with partners. We do this with children. You know, there we have to be able to recognize the unavailability of people, whether it's emotional or physical or time, whatever the unavailability is, we have to be able to recognize that and respect it because everybody's a little bit different. And when people are emotionally unavailable, I don't want you to get mad about that or get mad and resentful at that person for that. I want you to understand that they are emotionally unavailable because they have their own pain. They're not doing it on purpose to be mean or hurt you. They have their own internal struggles. That's what that's all about. We need to have empathy and love them for that and give them some grace instead of getting angry and resentful and personalizing it, making it, oh, they're doing it to me. I can't believe they're being that way to me. They're treating me that way. It's not about you. It's that they just have their own stuff going on inside of them. Now, let's move on to compliance patterns. And I think this is a lot more what we kind of talked about in that episode a couple of weeks ago with Michelle Ferris. It was such a fantastic episode. And we talked a lot about compliance patterns. And I think this is what most people view codependence as. So compliance patterns. Codependents with compliance patterns are often extremely loyal, remaining in harmful situations too long, right? That's another boundary issue. You see why this is the three-part series, because all these pieces play together, boundaries, codependent self-esteem. Being extremely loyal and remaining in situations too long, thats those are boundary and self-esteem issues. That's why we don't stand up and make changes. 
Um, codependents often compromise their own values and integrity to avoid rejection or anger, put aside their own interests in order to do what others want. I shared that story with you guys totally where I did this and I was so mad and it was sheer insanity and oh my gosh, I'm so grateful that's over. But <laughs> when you've heard that story, I will share it again. But um, yeah, putting aside your own interests to do what others want. Codependents are often hypervigilant regarding the feelings of others and take on those feelings, are afraid to express their beliefs, opinions, and feelings when they differ from those of others. This is something to, I feel like we really confuse a couple of words, okay? We confuse conversation for confrontation. And people say to me so often, I don't like confrontation. I don't like confrontation. And I'm like, well, why does it have to be confrontation? Why can't it just be a conversation? Like we're just talking. It doesn't have to be confrontational. It doesn't have to be aggressive. It's just conversation. And I think if we can start to make that shift in our own minds, when we disagree, it's not confrontational. It's just a conversation. And you can say, you can disagree and have conversation without being confrontational. So maybe it is, maybe you're arguing with your partner and they're saying something you don't agree. Okay, cool. It's not the end of the world. Nobody's going to fall apart if you disagree. This is something as humans that we really have to get past also. It is okay to disagree. There is no law on this planet that says we all have to agree with each other and have the same opinions and live our lives the same way. It's okay to have different thoughts and opinions and do things a different way. The important thing is that we respect and love one another regardless of our differences. You don't have to agree with me. I'm cool with that. But say you're having an argument with your partner and they say something you don't agree. It doesn't have to be confrontational. It doesn't have to turn into a fight. You can easily give them some validation and then express your part. So you validate by saying, yeah, I get where you're coming from. I can see how that makes sense. I can see how you would feel that way. It's not my opinion or I don't necessarily agree with every piece of that, but I totally get how you got there. I get how you feel that way. That's all, you guys. Conversation, not confrontation. But you don't want to stuff. <laughs> you don't want to stuff your beliefs and opinions and feelings and not ever express yourself and not have that solid sense of self, right? And stand in your own shoes and be you. You don't want to stuff all those things because then you're not being true to yourself. Oh, here's a good one. Codependence and compliance patterns often accept sexual attention when they want love. Well, hello. I think we call that my 20s. <laughs> this is what I did, you guys. I wanted love so much. I wanted to be loved. I wanted to be cared for and protected. And, and a lot of that remains true today, right? But I wanted it so bad. I was so unhealthy then that I thought if someone wanted me sexually, I thought those were almost the same thing. And I would take that as love when obviously those things are very separate. <laughs> Next one, make decisions without regard to the consequences. Oh boy, do we understand this in addiction? Make decisions regardless of the consequences. <laughs> How about that when we decide to drink again, knowing full well it's going to be a disaster and we're going to feel like crap and we're going to be in the shame spiral, right? That's a little compliance codependence. Just giving in like whatever. I don't care about myself enough to do it any differently. There's your self-esteem. I didn't plan ahead and have good boundaries. See how it all goes together? And we just comply. We just give in. Whatever. It's fine. I'll be fine. I'll get through it. I'll do better next time. 
And the last one in these compliance patterns is codependents often give up their truth to gain the approval of others or to avoid change. Ooh, we do this a lot in relationships too, right? Where you stay in the relationship because you, you're avoiding change. You don't want the change. You think about everything that you would have to do and everything that it would be. And it's so many things that you're like, F it, dude, I'll just stay. It's fine. We'll figure it out. We'll try to fix it. I'll keep doing this. Or give up your truth. I see this a lot in recovery too, where when people are in social situations and newly sober, you don't want to own your truth of not drinking because you want the approval of others. And that's always the thing. What do I say? What am I going to tell people? It's always about the approval of others instead of just owning your truth of, I don't effing feel like drinking right now, period. You know, <laughs> compliance, compliance, compliance. And the last one we're going to go into is control patterns because control is such a big issue, certainly with addicted people, because we feel so out of control in so many areas that we try to major control <laughs> everything else. And we do this with people, with our families, with work, everything. We try to control every single detail and it gets crazy. It will make you crazy. So here are some of the control patterns. Codependents often believe people are incapable of taking care of themselves. Now I'm going to tell you where I've seen this a lot with moms. And it was kind of surprising to me in the beginning of my career when I would see this because I'm not a mom, right? I mean, I'm a dog mom, but I'm not, I'm not married. I don't have kids. That was just not my path or my desire. And so in the beginning of my career, when I would see this, I, I was always a little bit shocked. Like, wow, that's weird. Where like mom would be so controlling because it's your baby that you created and built and birthed, right? <laughs> like I get that. There is this incredible connection there that nobody else will ever understand. But moms will get so controlling over everything. And like I would see like mom is going out of town. And she would be insanely like making lists of like every minute of the day and how to do every single activity and do it this way and do this and do this and do this and do this. And I was like, holy crap, nobody could live up to that, right? And I did, I used to do this a little bit myself, not to that extreme, but because I don't have kids, but where I got to was I, I expect a certain result. But the steps you take to get to that result, that's your business, right? Like you figure out your own steps. I don't need to micromanage and control your steps. You don't, your steps don't have to be my steps. And that's why I remember saying to this mom one time in a, in a session, and it was a couple session. I remember saying to her, like, listen, he's perfectly capable of taking care of your children. They're his children too, you know, like... He may not do everything exactly the way you would do it, but he will get it done. Your children will be safe. They will be fed. They will be in school every day and dressed and bathed and all of that. He is perfectly capable, but he doesn't have to do it second to second the way you would do it, right? We just get so controlling of all of these details. I was really bad about it in business with my employees, you know, and I had to really catch myself micromanaging and think about how bad that feels and how uncomfortable and gross it is. Like, I don't like it when people try to control me. Don't, don't try to micromanage me. I will act like a five-year-old with a temper tantrum in a split second, right? So I don't want to make other people feel that way. When you micromanage and you control people, it makes people feel like you don't trust them. You don't think that they're smart enough. And you're making people feel like they're less than. Like you have some superior way. My way is the best way. You have to do it my way or it's wrong. Right? Like you're making people feel like they're dumb and not valuable. So that was my lesson in that micromanaging and controlling people. It's like, back up, dude back up and get on your own side of the street. <laughs> so this is the end result we need, but the steps you take to get there are yours, right? That's how I stepped back from that control. 
Uh, control patterns, codependents often freely offer advice and direction without being asked. Oh boy, you know, I got to watch myself on this one because I am a helping professional. It's what I do all day, every day. I am helping people problem solve. So it is a natural response for me in any conversation. When somebody says they have a problem, I will instantly jump in with solutions. And I really have to catch myself and be careful because it's not always welcome. And I remember one of my clients slash dear friends who I adore, and if he's listening to this, he will crack up. But he called me one time just to tell me about some stuff that was going on in one of his businesses, and we were just chatting, and I started offering solutions, right? I started being a fixer, which also makes people feel not smart and not adequate, right? So you got to be careful with this. But I started fixing, and he said he handled it so perfectly. He's like, "Well, I wasn't really calling for solutions. I just wanted to, I just wanted to let you know what's going on, what I'm dealing with." And I love that he said that to me because it was just gently kind of putting me in my place. And we can all use those reminders. Right? He wasn't unkind. He wasn't confrontational. He wasn't mean. There was nothing for me to get mad about. He was just saying like, dude, I'm just calling to talk. I don't need you to fix. I don't need you to fix me. I'm okay. So I love that. I'd have to be super mindful of that, freely offering advice without being asked. Next one, becoming resentful when others decline their help or reject their advice. I used to have a friend that was really bad about this. Like if you asked her like, hey, what do you think about this? How would you handle this situation? And she gave you your her opinion. She would get mad if you didn't do it her way. Like she would be offended if you didn't do it her way. And I was like, well, I'm just troubleshooting. Like I just want different ideas and ways to think about it so I can get a full picture. But she would really get mad if you didn't take her advice. I never knew that that was a control codependence pattern. Next one, lavish gifts and favors on those they want to influence. I do this with my nieces and nephews, right? <laughs> like I'm always giving them gifts, not necessarily trying to control them, but definitely trying to influence them, right? Because I want them to like me. I've tried to stop that because, you know, kids are so, like, they just want more, 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 more. It's always, what did you bring me? Did you bring me something? Did you, did you get me something? Did you get me a present? Do I have a present? And I'm like, okay, we need to chill out on the gifts. Like, let's spend time together. And that's where the value is. But I, I really think I would have to dig into this a little bit more to understand it better. And this next one, we're right back in my 20s, okay? <laughs> Control pattern codependents often use sexual attention to gain approval and acceptance. My idea when I was younger and unhealthy, my idea was the hotter you are, the more people will like you. And in some ways, there's some truth to that, right? There's definitely more attention you will get, but it has nothing to do with genuine connection or anybody caring what your thoughts are. <laughs> so using sexual attention to get approval and acceptance, is an it's kind of an instant gratification thing, right? It's also the low-hanging fruit. Like it's the easiest thing to do that will always work for a quick fix, but there's no substance or value to it. But that's how I lived for a long, long, long time, decade and a half. That was me for sure. And I'm just going to read a few more off this list in the control patterns because they all kind of go together. And I think they're the ones that you'll most identify with. I will also include a link to this article so you can read the whole thing and see all the patterns. Um, I will put that in the show notes. And the show notes are the words, whatever platform you listen to your podcast on, there's a blurb that tells you what this episode is about. Those are the show notes. So when I say I'll leave that in the show notes, I'll put that link in the show notes. That's where you'll find it. And there are show notes, I think, on every single podcast platform because there has to be something to tell you what the heck we're going to talk about. Those are your show notes. So I will leave the link to this article. I will also add it to the resource library. So if you signed up to get that resource library, I will link that in the show notes as well. I will be adding all of this information over the next couple of weeks. I will continue adding more stuff to the resource library and I will put these articles in there as well. So the last ones I'm going to highlight are, are, um, have to feel needed in order to have a relationship with others, demand that their needs be met by others, 
use blame and shame to exploit others emotionally, refuse to cooperate, compromise, or negotiate, or pretend to agree with others to get what they want. Now, I highlight those because I think they're the most relatable. They're the things we do most often, right? Like if somebody doesn't meet our needs, we get angry and resentful and we blame and we shame. Or if we're in a disagreement or an argument or a fight with our partner, we'll blame and shame to get them to do what we want, right? It's all these tactics we use and everybody does it. You guys, it doesn't make us horrible people. It means that we've got some unhealthy patterns patterns that we need to start to shift, right? And the one I said, um, demand that their needs be met by others. This one too is you really want to get to a place where you are meeting your own needs. Now, obviously any relationship, friendship, family relationship, there's a give and take. Obviously we all know that and we do want to need and be needed with one another and that's fantastic. But when it comes down to my core things, my happiness, my joy, my sense of well-being, those are things that I have to be able to provide for myself right? I can't rely on other people to make me happy. I need to rely on myself to build a life that I love and be a human being that I love so I feel happy regardless of the outside circumstances, right? This is an inside job. It's not on anybody else to fix my insides, right? My insides are my responsibility, The last thing I want to talk about is this question that I got from one of our listeners. And let me read this to you. He says, I was wondering if you could talk briefly about the difference between being responsible to someone versus responsible for someone. Example, I'm not responsible for someone else and their feelings, but I am responsible to someone like my dad. So let's break this down. I am not responsible for anyone else's feelings or reactions or responses. When I am being myself out in the world, I can't constantly worry about how every person is going to respond, right? Because everyone else's feelings and reactions and responses are their responsibility. All I can do is my part. Your feelings are your part. That's for you to manage and figure out. So I'm not responsible for someone else or their feelings. I am responsible to someone. And he said, like my dad. So I'm going to use my dad as an example as well. So my father and I go to breakfast every Saturday morning. And we've been doing this for 10 plus years, 10 or 12 years, something like that. Saturday breakfast. And that's something I love to do, right? It is on my calendar every week, Saturday morning. Don't call me. I'll be with my father. So that's my Saturday. I am responsible to my father, my parents, or my siblings, or my partner, whoever it might be. I am responsible to them in the regard that if there is an emergency, everything else I have going on gets put on the back burner. I'm responsible to them in that way, right? And I think we all understand that and would agree any emergency situation, our stuff gets put to the side to handle the emergency situation. If my father reaches out to me, and says, hey, do you want to go grab dinner tonight? Or, hey, the car show's in town. Do you want to go do that? This is where I have to check my boundaries. Because if it's not interfering with my self-care or my downtime or my work or other obligations, if it doesn't interfere and I want to go hang out with my father And maybe consider it a little service, right? Because maybe he's lonely or his friend canceled on him at the last minute. These things happen. If it's not interfering with other things, then absolutely I can say yes and go do that. I am not responsible to him to go do leisurely things, right? There's no responsibility there. But if I want to and it's not interfering with my other things, then absolutely I can go do that. But if it's an emergency situation, if it's something important, this is just like we do in relationships, right? If you're 
partner has a business something, it might not be your favorite thing to do, but you're going to go do it because that's what you do as a partner. Now, if you've had a significantly difficult day and you need some self-care time and you need some quiet time, then maybe you don't go do the thing. You have to have a healthy boundary. So I hope that makes sense, uh, how we break that down, responsible for someone, responsible to someone. Please join us in the Facebook group so we can have more incredible conversation after the show. I love connecting with you guys there. I hope you're having a fantastic day and I will see you next week. You've reached the end of another great episode of the Addiction Unlimited podcast candid and honest conversation about addiction and recovery. Be sure to visit us at addictionunlimited.com to join the conversation and access show notes and links to everything we talked about. Love this episode? Please take 30 seconds to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes to help us improve and give you the information you want. Thanks for listening. See you next week.